everyone for being here today it means a lot and I want to thank Donald for being such a rock to the family and I have a little something about Eric gave me this Oops, sorry, just one moment. <laughs> and I held it for now so many years he gave it to me in my 20s and I've had it now 57 so like that's a long time <laughs> this is going to be always something I'll always have and um, one last thing before I sing um, he um, loved the song by Prince um, let's go crazy <laughs> and he sang it one day to me and it was so beautiful the way he sang it. And he can do prints like anything. And I wish I could have heard more of his singing. But anyways, he said, the part, dear beloved, we're gathered here today to get through this thing called life, electrograd life. It means forever, and that's a mighty long time. But I'm here to tell you there's something else, the afterworld, the world of never-ending happiness. You can always see the sun day or night. <laughs> Sorry. I knew this was going to happen, but it's okay. <laughs> so when you call up the shrink in Beverly Hills, you know the one, doctor, everything will be all right. And I hope that you, Eric, will be all right forever with mom. <laughs> and I know where I hope. Okay, just give me a sec. Thank you, dear. Yeah, just in case. I hope I can sing the song. Jeez. <laughs> well, this song here I'm going to sing. Um, every time I heard it on the radio, I would think of Eric. and It came on quite often in the years. So I wanted to sing it to you today. And it's called, um, I forget. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's going to rain today. All right. Whew, I gotta pee. Just a minute. Right. I hope you can hear me. I'm sure you can. <laughs> Broken windows 
and empty hallways a pale dead moon in the sky streaked with gray human kindness is overflowing and i think it's going to rain today Scarecrows dressed in the latest styles. Frozen smiles to chase love away. Human kindness is overflowing. And I think it's going to rain today. Lonely, lonely, tin can at my feet, I think I'll kick it down the street, that's the way to treat a friend, bright before me the signs implore me. Help the needy and show them the way. Human kindness is overflowing. And I think it's going to rain today. Lonely, lonely. Tin can at my feet, I think I'll kick it down the street. That's the way to treat a friend. Bright before me, the signs implore me. Help the needy and show them the way. overflowing and I think it's going to rain today hello everyone thank you Donald for asking me to speak um, and share some of Eric's lovely words Eric wrote in grade 8 age 11 1977 news of the stars some of our stars died today. Elvis Presley died. Some say heart attack, and some say drugs. Some say he killed himself. Well, whatever happened to him is done. Elvis was one of my best singers. Though he died, I will always like his movies, his songs, and his face on posters. In 1977, some of Eric's drawings. He has a cartoon drawing of Donald Duck, where he asks, will Donald Duck ever learn to cook? Will the world ever know? And also his wonderful drawing of, and colorful of Miss Piggy. In 1977, he also drew a lovely cartoon that says, sisters are mean, but they still love you. <laughs> and Donald the boss. In 1980, Eric is 14, and he wrote a card to his mom in the hospital. Hi, Mom. I love you. I hope your operation is complete. I hope nothing happens to you like not walking or legs. Hope you are not bored. It gets boring around here without you around. It is home sweet home since Donald took over. You're a cotton ball to me, Mom. Love is in our house for many hours and for many hours to come. I had so much fun last night with Marina. We laughed a lot and I had lots of fun. Hope you're happy, not sad. You are a beautiful ball with many colors. Marina played masterpiece with me. Of course I won. I hope to see your skin without the bandages on. I hope you get well very soon. I love you, mummy. He has a full page drawing here of Marina. <laughs> 
and a full page drawing of Donald. This is uh, Eric's statement in the Elmer Police Report, March the 8th, age 15. He circled single and occupation, none. I was at the OPP station for about two hours. I gave him my statement on stealing the money from the gym room at East Elgin Secondary School. We went home to get my stuff to move to the next house. At 7.55, I had buzzed nurse. She'll give me a turkey sandwich as soon as she can because I don't have supper. She gave me two ginger ales. That should last me a few hours, she said. In 1982, Eric wrote diaries at the age of 15 while he was in the St. Thomas General Hospital after his suicide attempt. Page one of the diary, March 9th. My feeling about what's happening. I feel it had to happen. Things would have gone worse as time went on. I feel I need to be alone for a while, out of the family situation, away from arguments and all that. I cried when Mom and Donald left for a while until I know I'm safe and, that's, and that it's okay. I didn't like the feeling of being wheeled in and out of elevators and down the halls. Sitting in a wheelchair beside an old person in the elevator gave me a chill. Page two of the diary. A nurse had to tell me what a bowel movement is at 736. Page five of the diary. I list of people I don't want to see. Elder, my father, Daniel Dehane, Therapists, social workers from Ontario Hospital. Page 12 from the diary. Many things I think of when I look at the walls while lying here or looking out the window. One, is it worth it to go back home? Two, should I go to school? Three, should I remain alive? Four, am I important to the world? Five, should I remain locked up? Six, do I need help or do I need care? Page 39 of the diary, 7.01, 34 seconds. I'm going to watch The Muppets on TV. Page 45, altogether I've watched 12 hours, 14 minutes of TV. Page 48, bed number three is a 60 to 90 year old. Bed number four is me, 15 year old, 16 next month. Page 58 of the diary. I'm going to draw a Snoopy picture for bed number three, the old man. Page 61, I've drawn five to 10 pictures today. I've done two pictures for one nurse, Lori, and the other nurse one, and the, and the other one for Connie. I met another nurse who would like me to draw her, nurse Jackie. I drew her one. Page 123 of the diary, November the 3rd. I am reading Reader's Digest at 7.16 and 12 seconds. An elder came to talk to me, but I didn't want to, so he left. I read that there's 80 calories in a slice of bread. I'm going to play with my Rubik's Cube some more. Page 127. This is the day I might go home. I wait to see buttons on the family, my warm bed, going to a new school. Page 130 of the diary. There once was a cat who was very fat. She sat on a hat, and that was that by Eric DeHane at 8.04, 43 seconds. June 29, 1982, this is not long after the suicide attempt from the London Hospital. Eric did a lovely drawing of Snoopy. Dear Mom, I'm feeling very good. I hope to get out of this ward so I live out there. I love you lots. I miss being with you. Even though we had arguments, there were good times. I also miss Buttons, my pal. Is he being a good little dog? If not, say I'll get after him. And this is uh, the picture of Snoopy saying the Buttons better be a good boy. On August 10th, 1982, a letter written from the London psychiatric hospital. Eric is 16. Dear mom, hi mom, how's life? Cool, eh? I miss you already. I can't believe this place is driving me crazy. I hate it here. Well, I always make the best of things. Love, Eric. P.S. Here's a poem I wrote. LPH. LPH is the place where you're in a rat race. No place to turn. Your brain starts to burn. There's no help. 
you run around like a help, helpless whelp, trapped in a shell, living through hell, stuck in a hole filled with fire and coal. People yelling, people keep telling, you're in trouble, you'll break like a bubble. You better stop and should. I want to get out. On August 19th, 1982, So there was some, um, this is what Donald had said to him, this is what happens when you're a pack rat. So his rat ate most of this, this letter that uh, Eric had mailed. You can see where it's all been chewed up. <laughs> August 24th, 1982. Dear Mom, I just got a tape from a, a dumb broad who was going to throw it out. It's air supply. I'm paying $5 for it. Date unknown. Dear Mom, I was not well today. They gave me a drug that made my muscles stiffen up and made me dizzy. I passed out. Well, I had a great time home last week. I love you, Mom, and also Donald. P.S. I love you. Date unknown. Dear Mom and family, some bad news. My girl is going to Montreal to be there for a year. I feel really sad. But maybe when I'm on a day pass, I'll meet another girl. February 26, 1984. Dear Mom, I'm going to get out of here one of these days, but no date has been set. I'm in the worst ward in the hospital. This program has done nothing for me. The only way I can live on is through the help of the patients. Well, I seem to always come back. I don't blame if you are not proud of me. I was one of the family who never made it. It's too late to say sorry. So anyways, Mom, I'll always love you no matter what. Take good care of the two dogs. Say hi to Donald and Marina. I guess Ron's been doing very good. I haven't seen him lately. Well, I miss you all so much. Love always. P.S. I love you. Love you a lot. October 9, 1990. Eric was going to see his mom, and he did this drawing. And he's written 1, 692 hours before we meet in December. October 6, 1990. I got a needle, 3rd of October. They also gave me two daily pills plus Valium to calm me down. Reason is I can't sleep and insomnia might be due to my bad headaches. I hope so because it hurts sometimes to the point of crying out loud. Hey, Mom. October the 11th, 1990. Dear Mummy, I think of your face every day and long to hug you and kiss you. How's Ron? Donald? Marina and my nieces, plus your lovers. 1990. So I have this really lovely card that Eric wrote, and he's got all these little hearts cut out with some really lovely notes. Keep smiling, thinking of you all. Hug you, squeeze, and kisses. Thinking of you. I love mom, I love Marina, I love Donald, I love Ron, I love life. June 4th, 1992. I'm feeling good with the medication. The hallucinations and voices are now gone. The only thing left to cure is my bad dreams at night. June 6th, 1992. The doctor said I'll be out, of, out soon. Good, eh? I think all of the family, and I'm glad they're not in my shoes. I suffer a lot. October 10th, 1992. Donald, I'm sorry I haven't written much. All I can offer you is my prayers and love. Till I win the Lotto 649, eh? It's too bad I lost my job. I hope I have the chance to further my career in computers. That's if I don't go to jail. I don't think I could handle being in jail again. The other times I come out effed up, effed me up and hard to be hospitalized. It's hell. I wouldn't want anyone else to go through that. April the 21st, 1993, it's Eric's 27th birthday. My family, today I spent time in my mind asking myself what I need for my birthday. What I really need is for someone to hold me and say everything is all right. And just three words, I care and love you. People always advise me to accept life, forgive and forget. I can't do that and never will. I'm looking for something I'll never find. I'm sick for life, I'm stuck. 
I can't survive in the past and I don't believe in tomorrow. I believe in today. My desire is to live in dreams I know will never come true. I often feel I don't belong. I'm okay or am I crazy? November 21, 1993, Eric is just out of the hospital and he's happy to see his cat Silver, but not feeling orientated. Things are not all right and no longer I see things normal. I want to sleep, but will I see tomorrow? December 2nd, 1993. Mom, on the 10th of this month is my psychiatric assessment. My nerves are bad, but I've stayed a good boy. I'm sad when I have to remember bad times. I've recovered from the poisoning. I'm glad I lost the 50 pounds, and now it's been 10 months I haven't touched drugs or alcohol. December 9th, 1993. Mommy, things haven't changed much at this point in my life. Jehovah has blessed my life because tomorrow I may be admitted and possibly committed. There's five tons of snow on the ground. To get to my reevaluation, I'll probably go by tank. I still shed blood tears from past traumas. P.S. One million hugs, 3,000 kisses, and a handshake too. December 12, 1993. The meeting is postponed. This increase is no good. I often feel I'm dying slowly. I'm hardly ever awake. It's still Monday. Mom, if this is not hell and the past was not hell, then what's to come of all this pain? Where is this Jehovah and why isn't he helping me? 1995, prose at 29. Daylight. Finally, I was free of the turmoil and abuse and wanted to renew my life, to get to know my needs, myself, and desires and hopes, and also passions and dreams. Moonride. I sat gazing at farmers in a field, and a cry of a new baby in nature hummed through the air. It was a normal day where all was calm and remained the same since I could remember. I wondered where my life was headed and where my heart and soul were going to belong and where my future lied. As the tears began to fall, I laid down in the bristle grass and wished to sleep and find myself in a new place and time, but awoke with a stranger's hand upon my shoulder, a person I came to know and dislike, my father. Everyone deserves a chance at the top. Looking at another one's life, knowing you deserve the same or wishing on things that can't be possible, born with a gift but no wealth or treasure, home to build on, being raised with parents you wish could have been replaced with less abusive ones, knowing you should be somewhere else than your present situation. Standing still. There were days I cried alone, myself to sleep. Things others found no value in what I would keep. My loved ones were no longer in sight. I would sit by my window and look out each night. I would think of what in life there was left for me to do. All the people said things, many bad, but oh so true. I spent my days holding the young and old, sharing all the wisdom I was told. So now I lay it all to rest. I've done what I could, I did my best. So much more time left to kill, awaiting death and standing still. By Eric Joy. Summer of 1996. To my family. I admire and respect your courage, and I'm impressed with all you've accomplished. I'm proud to be a member of a growing and loving family like ours is. We've overcome a lot together in our lives and separately. I hope the love I have for all of you is equal to my own placed in my heart, where it will always be for you and the future you may face. You all touched my life, and I love you. Smiley face. Smile, you have a brother and a friend and someone you know in BC who says to stop crying and start living. Good luck in the upcoming years. Eric Joy. 1997, May 4th, it's a painting that Eric has here. Show that there. <laughs> Where he's like, I'll always be there. I will care forever. Nineteen ninety-seven, 
I struggled to survive my last days among society and its BS head hands. I hang in with all I am and do what I can. Thanks for your warm thoughts and prayers. I love you, Mom, and stay the same to all who care. Sincerely, Eric Joy. So we have um, a letter that Eric had sent as well. And he's got, uh, cart got um, some cartoons with um, going to all your siblings. <laughs> And then he also has a, uh, a Far Side cartoon. And the Far Side cartoon, do you want me to, to read that? As Harriet turned the page, a scream escaped from her lips. There was Donald, his strange disappearance no longer a mystery. Hmm. And the letter is addressed to Home Sweet Home. Sorry, I meant to show the characters, too. There's a character, too, of, of Ronnie and uh, of Marina and of Donald as well on the back. And this one, Eric was very talented dry. He's got a full cartoon page. And he writes, please write my real name from now on, Eric Dehane. It's a type letter that was sent in 2000. I think often, if the incest and ritual abuse hadn't plagued me with post-traumatic stress disorder, I may have had the life I admire and wish for that others have. I often feel empty, lost, and lonely. I feel like a wild animal in a zoo wishing to be rewarded for my even getting through life. I run. I hide. I fight. I try my best and through it all, still looking for the open door giving me an exit. All the pain therapy, drugs, advice, lies, and BS do not help. Love will and can heal, but in a cold world such as this, it's found but quickly lost. Not enough to set people like me free. Your son, Eric Joy. And this is the last drawing that Eric sent that he drew of a young Elvis. Date unknown. There's a date unknown of a letter. My brother, I don't really know how to begin. I love you so much and thank you with all my heart. I'm very pleased and touched by all your love before and forevermore. There's a place called home and you're always welcome to be in. And that's my heart, Donald. I don't know how we survived. I'm just glad we did. I'm so glad and happy to know that I have a good brother and a real one who loves me and knows how I feel inside. Someday soon we'll see each other again. Until then, with love. Thanks again. When Eric's mother got sick with dementia, she couldn't write, so unfortunately the written communication ceased in the early 2000s. And so, um, the last place Eric lived, um, I asked them to send his last stuff and so we're gonna open I didn't open it yet they just send it so we'll see what it is and then I'll do the eulogy ACDC, Kiss, and a, record and a record player who's record player. That's nice, eh? Yeah. Thanks, Richard. So. <sighs> Flashback, 1966, April. Mom's tummy is getting bigger. Feel my tummy, she says. I felt something kicking in there. I didn't understand it, but it was new, strange, and awesome. I have to go away, and Sister Agnes will take care of you. 
What I remember from that week Eric arrived on earth is this. I had to sleep with an old woman with a wooden leg. Every night she stole my pillow. She was also a bad cook. God, it's enough to turn someone gay. But then she left, thank God, and I got to hold baby Eric in my arms. Mom said, Donald, you get to help me take care of him. And so I did, or did I? Eric and I were basically fraternal twins. From day one, we slept in the same room, dressed the same. Initially, it looked like my older brother, Ronnie, and I would be like Cain and Abel in our family, but it was Eric and I who ended up East of Eden brothers. You know the classic story. Okay, in our case, admittedly twisted. One is going to be responsible, one not. But everyone knows the bad one is good, and the good one would rather be um, is bad. And the drama includes which one is more likely to die before the closing credits. The scriptwriter has to make sure the audience knows that neither was better than the other in the end. Unfortunately, real life doesn't tie up our end in pretty knots. And today, there won't be any Hitchcock MacGuffins. In our version of this movie, predictably, at the beginning, Eric and I were both were called sensitive. We had talents. We could sing, draw, write. But outside the home, whereas Eric was extroverted, had fun, played, had an energy, I was introverted, the quietest child of the four of us, the one who least acted out, Eric the most. Trust me, I wish that was a MacGuffin. Eric truly was happy, oddly happier earlier on than the three of us. I thought I was sometimes. I guess it's not surprising that this outgoing fourth child, five-year-old Eric, when he was approached by his abuser, our father, immediately balked to the whole house. We three were in shock. We had never even discussed our experiences with each other over a period of years. Everything changed from that point except the abuse. I was no longer Eric's brother and never played with him. Thank God our older brother Ronnie and our sister Marina did. At 10, I became his protector, educator, parent, and I failed miserably. <laughs> On all counts, except one. Protector from the predator. Now it all seems so horribly ironic. I knew I was damaged goods, so I made sure I was abused instead of him. As a child, I thought, it's too late for me, but Eric has a chance of being innocent. Hundreds have told us over the years, thank you not, that Eric was responsible for his own path. Look at how well you three turned out. Hundreds of others told us tough love is the answer. Unfortunately, we listened to you. Turns out everyone is a reviewer. Abusing a child is not a fair test to head towards a path of healthy decisions, especially when all the curveballs that came his way. For example, a couple of years after Eric's disclosed, he was placed in a special ed class without the powers that be knowing he was sexually abused. Again, his 100% real-time reaction was being punished for telling the truth and not being able to, to concentrate in class and communicate why in terms an outside world would understand. Take this collage painting he did when he was around 13. The teacher marked on the back, some colors in the water are incorrect. It is a human drowning. Another sign, right, that was missed. I remember like it was yesterday. Our father agreeing with the school that there's something wrong with Eric. And also me thinking, as always, in silence, you're pathetic. And you wonder why I can act? Maybe that's the clue. I always did. Eric didn't know how. He was 100% real, 24 hours in stereo. And remember the stigma back then of being placed in special ed. So there Eric stood out for being a Jehovah's Witness, wearing my hand-me-downs, and being in that class. And that's before he even opened his mouth. And trust me, when Eric did, it was something else. Even in this dysfunctional hell, it was clearly apparent Eric was gifted. Yet it wasn't recognized by anyone but us, as no one in his world outside our home considered him anything but a problem child. Tell a kid he's a problem long enough and he'll fulfill your prophecy. Do I even need to spell this out? Our father encouraged the idea that Eric 
be considered a problem child, a child with mental health issues because it helped protect his secret. Hmm, punishment for being the first one to disclose. He even had the nerve to have his lawyer state in court he never touched Eric. Yet, there would be no trial if it wasn't for Eric because he was the first one to disclose in the first place. How can you disclose something that never happened? Apparently fake, but real news has existed for decades. This is why it was not surprising this month that the funeral home's lawyer had us take out abused by his father. So what else is new? Back then, again, I protected Eric. I didn't want him involved in the trial. I wouldn't let the media talk to him. I didn't want his experiences sensationalized, I, trivialized, judged as ours had been. I could, I could make up this plot line if I tried. It's just, just a week or two after the trial ended, I had a contract to daily early morning clean at doctor's office in Elmer. Mom helped me while Eric sat in the waiting room until he could walk to school. He was 15. On one of these routine days, later in the day, I received a call that Eric had overdosed. He had snuck in the doctor's office and grabbed some of the drugs unbeknownst to mom and I, took them and collapsed at high school. And you wonder why I'm a non-trusting control freak. My own brother got me fired, and if he had died, I would have had to pay for the funeral without a job. 40 years later, you bitch. Eric would have laughed at that one. Oh, it got worse. In 82, when, while Eric is recovering in the hospital, we are informed Eric will be excommunicated from our church. He was 15. Who cares about going to some version of hell? We were living it. I've always felt Eric was the most honest one in terms of the abuse. I don't judge for one second his choices. A street life, drugs, the numbing of feeling. How could I? I wanted to run away when I was 12. Why not get paid for what we were doing for free? But I couldn't. I wasn't going to leave mom and my younger siblings. The question isn't, how did Eric make it to here? It's how did he survive against all odds to get to the age of 54? No one understands Trump world better than my family. People were nicer to our father than Eric. More people believed his lies than Eric's truths. If you hear the great lie first, we four had to make our case again and again and again until we woke up years ago that all that matters is that we know the truth. Eric's death is the only reason I am going there today because his truth will set him finally free. Eric, by far, had the most book, drama, movie-worthy life. The Kardashians have had a reality show for 10 years. They got nothing on us Dehaney's. It kills me that 99% of Eric's stories will never be told. In just the 1% I do know, it was Eric, who I, who I thought I protected, that ended up working the streets, tried to burn down his first foster home, and also a decade later, a decade later the psychi psychiatric ward he was in, he tried to burn that one down too, and the drama never ended. In one of those wards, Eric met a young woman who was under psychiatric care. They developed a relationship. The only reason I found out about it is that this connection resulted in two children. I found the young woman's father's home in Masonville area. Yes, I expected a butler to answer the door. It was that big. And there I stood with some measly gifts. I explained I was Eric's brother. And from his front door, the man said, if you were Eric, I would have answered the door with a shotgun. I said, I'm so sorry. The man said, I will not be taking your gifts, nothing against you, but don't come back, and if I ever see your brother again, it will be with a bullet in his head. Upsetting? What isn't? About a year later, I received a notice in the mail from this man's lawyer that they would like Eric to give up his parental rights to the two children and sign them over to this man and his oldest son. I was in no quandary. Basically, homeless Eric, involved in God knows what, versus a well-off blood family adopting his two kids instead of foster care? Remember fire starter Eric? He hated foster homes, so I convinced Eric to sign over the rights. I told him, the, use the ensuing years to get your act together so that when they look you up, when they are of legal age, you will be able to explain why you couldn't take care of them. He agreed. All four of us felt responsible for everything. Each other, mom, Eric felt responsible for spilling the beans, and years later, for breaking up the family. I have respons felt responsible for his hell for 40 years. Marina wished she could have helped Eric more, and Ronnie wished he had done something so that Daniel wouldn't have abused his younger siblings and mom. God, there is a theme here, isn't there? And it doesn't take Einstein to figure out who really is to blame. As the guilt, guilt debilitates me, of which survivor guilt is just a part, I do think it's ironic that Eric's abuser has no guilt. Daniel Dehaney and his many, many aliases Noel Haney, et cetera, et cetera. Five wives and a new set of three boys and a girl, and oh, a daughter from a girlfriend in between the two sets. 
He at 87 has thrived while Eric strived to exist. Why, he even once called the police on Eric for stealing from him. Well, I guess that's not really surprising since he called the police on mom, telling them she stole his sewing machine. Why, he even sent me a postcard from jail saying he forgave me for everything I did to him. Oh, he even topped that. He sent a letter to a newspaper in Belgium informing them that I was dating a black man who had AIDS. Okay, now that's a MacGuffin, but that's his story, not ours. Come to think of it, his story has a lot of MacGuffins. You don't need to wonder where my sense of humor comes from. Eric had it out too. I believe Eric is the most amazing one in our family. By a sure will to live, he survived a suicide attempt at 15, many more, and chose living for 39 more years. He ended up not wanting to die. One of the number one questions I've been asked during these four decades since we went public, have you spoken to your father? No, really. I have never spoke, answered, acknowledged Daniel in 44 years. I don't engage with destroyers of souls. And that is how we must come to terms with today's service. The murder of this tortured soul. My memoir fills in the early blanks and it ended with my receiving a call that my sister died. But she didn't. The police had the wrong marina. For two hours I thought she was dead. Oh, by the way, who let mom and I know that my sister had died? Daniel. My second memoir would begin with the call in 81 that Eric was near death, the doctor telling me to plan his funeral. But he lived. Now, that second memoir would end now, 40 years later, with getting a call that Eric did, in fact, die of a drug overdose. Can you understand why none of this is real to me? But everything was always real to Eric. Take my last conversation with Eric three and a half years ago, just after Mom died. We Skyped for 37 minutes. Eric had slipped back into old habits a bit, he told me, since the news of Mom's death. Bobby, his agency director in Vancouver, had arranged for him to have a counselor again, he asked for him. And he said he was doing so much better and that losing mom took him back. As we talked, when I'd cry, he put his hat over his front and looked down and go, I can't watch you cry. Pretty sweet. And I tried and snap out of it. It was a lovely, sane chat. He definitely was not on drugs, and that is a miracle. He said it was the hardest thing he ever did to get off them. He asked what I did. I said I never did them because I don't trust them. I'd rather navigate the pain. And then he says, that's why I took them, so I wouldn't suffer the pain. I told him all the family knows that, that he is a good person. And does he know how much he is loved? And he said, yes. I treasure memories like this. He died from an accidental drug overdose. The coroner was so kind. This woman went beyond the call of duty, wanted to know Eric's history, assured me he was not in pain at the end. Not even knowing of my last conversation with Eric, she told me it is common for men of the streets to lose their way after their mothers die. And with mom having dementia for years, he lost her years earlier. Having to arrange things from so far away was tough. But everyone was so great in the bizarre process. We didn't find out until 10 days after Eric passed away that he had. When I asked the Ministry of Health worker how I could find out if Eric had writings, etc., she gave me the name where he had lived his last six months. I immediately called and the man at the desk said they were devastated at Eric's passing. You'll want to talk to the manager. She comes on and says, we're so glad to talk to someone who knows Eric. I'm just looking at a comic strip that Eric drew. She said they all took to Eric. They were in shock because Eric was not using. So I was thrilled and devastated in a whole new way. Now it was even more tragic. Eric was liked, made connections, wanted to live and just fell off the wagon. His poor older body just couldn't take what, the norm years, what was the norm years earlier. Then I spoke to the house manager and discovered one last shocking detail. Eric had asked him to keep money in the safe for him to buy CDs, etc. He had $600 saved up. This is the guy on social assistance. If you know anything about the drug world, drug world no one saves money in a safe who is a regular user where every dollar goes to a, another hit. Final proof he was clean. I wonder if he did that final hit to numb his feelings, memories, that day. If love could heal a heart, you, Eric, would have healed decades ago because the amount of love, Mom, I, my sister and brother, felt for you. There is not room enough in this world to fill. I tried. God, I tried. But I failed you miserably. I had good intentions. I had my own demons, frankly the twisted existence of being our father's concubine and our mother's best friend, for starters. But no excuses. You needed the hug. 
that I just couldn't give. I was on a quest, a quest to reinvent how we were seen in history. I didn't want anything negative. I wanted us to divorce ourselves from the victim story, the tarnish of being son of that father. I needed to achieve as much as possible for you and mom, and I kept thinking I had time to give you both the things that would make you happy. I almost made it. We re redid our wills last year. Eric shared what was going to be held by our brother Ronnie, because that's how much we trust each other. Ronnie would have held Eric's money and helped him. If I had achieved taking care of you, you and mom would have been farting in silk, Eric. Every package, letter, or card I sent you, I wrote, I think about you every day, and I love you more than you will ever know. I was planning on seeing you this year. I was going to, to go to Vancouver and buy things to make your day-to-day -day living better. I had a sense of urgency, purpose, a premonition. Then the virus struck, and I kept telling Morris and my friends, I need, I must get to see Eric as soon as this is over. That was the number one priority. The day after you died, and me not knowing, I sent you a package with a postcard from London pleading for you to call me, that I would see you as soon as the virus situation was better. I know what parents who have missing loved ones go through, dreading the inevitable, but desperately needing something tangible. I tell you that fulfillment of my worst nightmare, the call, is worse than you can imagine, unless you have experienced it. As if your heart were not only being stabbed, but diced and pounded, and when you think there can be no more tears left, no more of your heart left to feel, the waves crash and crush again. A torrent of memories, regrets, hopes, and envelops you. And if you are lucky, and I am fortunate, that outside expressions of love have fought their way through as if scraps of a heart were found and it is beating again, sewed together, full of a million little stitches, but it's working. It's pumping blood, enabling my brain to commit to making sure Eric's memory is alive. That Eric having been here mattered, that his death is not in vain. That makes me happy. Someone seeing this will think of you you and I have never heard from your children. Maybe they'll see this eulogy. Maybe you fought to stay clean for that day they would find you. So many people who never met you have shed a tear over you. You, Eric Dehaney, will never be able to sing a duet. Because when we were together, I had not found my voice, but in an odd way, you had. Well, you can sing duets to your heart's content now. Mom and Judy Garland can talk about how they both died on the toilet. And then Judy can sing over the rainbow to you and Mom. And when I was looking through Eric's stuff, he drew Judy Garland when he was in grade eight. You, like me, loved Judy Garland, Eric. You drew, drew her, and you wrote us in 1990. When I'm with you, it is as if a rainbow after a storm proudly showing my colors. Imagining any form of peace for Eric now is, well, it's like a beautiful painting. Not a Picasso, that's what his life looked like here. I imagine a Vincent van Gogh. And coincidentally, Mum was born 93 miles from Van Gogh. Eric, six degrees ain't what it used to be. You have great company now. Hug Mum for us. Say hi to Vincent. Hope you and Judy are doing a duet. But to, true to form, I'm still going to be boss and give you advice. I imagine you will have turned into the most beautiful form of yourself. For the love of, oops, well, you know, avoid a guy who wears one glove for no apparent reason grabs his crotch intermittently, and could be dangling a baby off a cloud, I'm just saying. May your soul find moments of peace that you never had on earth. Good night, my sweet Prince Eric. Thank you. <laughs>